Didn't we get interrupted at an interesting point in our last lesson? Well, we need to continue with it. We were talking about various kinds of attractive forces that exist between things, particularly attractive forces that exist between things that we may not have thought much in the way of attractive forces existed between before, such as those particular compounds of that were organic that we were talking about are the chlorine and the bromine and the iodine. Well, let's go back and have a look at what it was we were dealing with in those sections. We were talking about the types of intermolecular forces. And we were talking about, we're just about through with that section. We were talking about dipole-dipole interactions, the induced ones. We're going to continue with that. Then we'll get into phase changes. And though I doubt that we'll get there today, or in this lesson, we will do an extensive session on the solid state. Now, we were talking about dipole-dipole forces. And to be exact, when we were talking about all of these kinds of forces, we talked about the ion-to-ion -ion permanent forces as being very strong. Those, those forces that hold ions together, those are very strong forces. Then ion to dipole forces are very strong also, not as strong as ion to ion. Then there's some dipole-dipole forces that are very significant, particularly those dipole-dipole forces that are hydrogen bonds. And you have to be prepared to deal with the question of when can hydrogen bonds exist? because that plays an important role in the properties of certain things. And hydrogen bonds exist any time you have hydrogen bonded to oxygen, fluorine, nitrogen, sometimes chlorine, and sometimes in some cases you will see some hydrogen bonding even when hydrogen is bonded to sulfur. So don't be surprised if you see that. But hydrogen bonding is a very important dipole-dipole force, and that is a permanent kind of force. And then we got into the much weaker, short-acting, dipole-dipole instantaneous forces, the instantaneous induced dipoles. Well, let's go back and continue looking at this. When the strengths of the intermolecular forces are compared, the ionic attractions are the strongest. Then, the ion dipoles. Ion dipoles like water to sodium chloride or sodium ions and chloride ions. Then your hydrogen bonds. And then your other permanent polar forces. Maybe, maybe, dip maybe dipole forces that are not as strong as hydrogen bonds, but nonetheless are permanent. And then bringing up the rear are the London forces, are the instantaneous induced dipoles. Now, boiling points and solubilities are truly impacted by these intermolecular forces. And it's often these intermolecular forces that dictate these solubilities and boiling points. Well, we'll get to solubilities later, but right now, let's look at boiling points. As the intermolecular force increases, the boiling point increases. Got that? So the intermolecular force increases, the boiling point increases. So let's list these compounds in order of increasing boiling points. Are you ready? Here they are. There's sodium chloride, helium, carbon dioxide, and methyl alcohol. Well, what's the order? Well, I tell you what. Let's see if we can figure out what that order ought to be. Let's see. Sodium chloride. Now, sodium chloride is ionic. Oh, you know those forces are going to be very, very strong. Helium, well, helium is an atom, and, and it's not, so it doesn't have polarity of any kind. And not only that, it's a little bitty atom. It's going to be very low, isn't it? That's going to be induced dipoles. All right. 
Carbon dioxide. Well, carbon dioxide. Remember carbon dioxide? It's linear. It's oxygen to carbon to oxygen. Yeah, remember that? It's kind of negative here, kind of negative over here, maybe. Somewhat positive in the middle, but it's all kind of spread out, sort of neutral. Not very many forces existing there, but it's certainly bigger than your helium is, isn't it? Well, how about this? Oh, look at this. CH3, CH2OH, and another molecule of CH3, CH2OH comes along, and can you see hydrogen bonding occur? Oh, yeah. So I do believe then that if we list these things in order of increasing boiling point, that the lowest one is going to be helium. Do you agree? Let me slide that up a little bit so you can see it better. How's that? Helium. The next one, I believe, is going to be carbon dioxide. The next one is going to be this compound over here that has that hydrogen bonding in it. And then the next one is going to be sodium chloride. This one has the highest. And this one has the lowest. Now, do you see the kind of reasoning that you should bring to this kind of a question? Well, let's see. How about these? Well, I listed them. Well, I did say that. That's exactly what we talked about, isn't it? And we know what the order is on that. We know that the lowest one is helium, the next is carbon dioxide, the next is methyl alcohol, and the highest one is the sodium chloride. How about these? All right, now let's look at this one for a minute. Hmm, think about it. Takes you back to your days of study of bonding, doesn't it? Well, let's see. What kind of bonding is in magnesium oxide? Ionic? Yeah. And what about neon? Oh, there's no bonding in there at all. It doesn't have any ions or anything. It's kind of like helium was. It's a little bigger than helium, though, isn't it? So it's going to have to be induced dipoles. All right. Hydrogen sulfide, H2S. Do you remember what we said? Well, here you have hy hydrogen to sulfur. This is somewhat negative. This is somewhat positive. This is somewhat positive. So it has a, a bit of a um, dipole. Dipole's going in that direction, not necessarily a very strong one. But it's this one there. And then you've got this alcohol over here, this CH3OH. And you can just see it doing this number, can't you? Hydrogen bonding. So if we put these in order from the lowest over here to the highest over here. I believe the lowest one's going to be the neon. And I think next is going to be, oh, I think the H2S. Do you agree? And then how about the alcohol? And then, of course, our ionic substance, which is magnesium oxide. Do you get the idea about how to compare these? Now let's talk about phase changes. Phase changes. When we talk about phase changes, we're going to be talking about a number of topics. We're going to be talking about vapor pressure. We'll talk about changes of state, because when we talk about phase changes, changes of state is what we really think about. But we need to talk about vapor pressure in there, too. We'll talk about some of the unique properties of water. We'll talk about phase diagrams and the information that you can get from a phase diagram. And we'll talk about surface tension, why bugs can walk on water. All right. Vapor pressure. Liquid turns to a vapor. Why does liquid turn to a vapor? Why does this liquid sitting down here in the bottom of this evaporating dish vaporize and come off? Well, that's a good question. What do you think the answer is? 
I could put this in a higher atmospheric pressure and the stuff would still evaporate. Why does it come off? Do you remember the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution curve? Oh, we studied that way back when, didn't we? Here's a Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution curve. Now let's look at it. Here I have a distribution of molecules right here at a lower temperature. See the lower temperature there? Can you see that all right? It's, it's not showing up real well, but we'll have to live with it. And then here is that same group of molecules at a higher temperature. Now notice, of course, as the temperature gets higher, the energy of the molecules increases. This right here, plotted along here, is the number of molecules. So when we have the lower temperature, we have a large number of molecules right in here, right close around the average energy of these molecules. We have a few that are higher. But as we increase the temperature, the number of molecules distributed at each of these energies increases. It just kind of elongates and flattens out here. Can you see why evaporation is a function of temperature? That as you increase the temperature, the energy of the molecules increases. Or the overall energy increases and the greater number of molecules are the number of molecules at the greater energy increases. Now suppose this is the energy required for evaporation. Do you see that on this right here at the lower temperature, very few of the molecules have enough energy to evaporate. But at the high temperature, a lot of molecules have the energy to evaporate. Therefore, evaporation is going to occur more rapidly at a higher temperature than at a lower temperature, as well shown by the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution curve. So remember, as the temperature increases, more molecules have the energy to become a vapor. Now let's talk about changes of state. When you, and I know you know these, but I feel better reminding you. Solid to liquid is melting. Liquid to solid is freezing. And usually they occur together. A liquid to a gas is vaporization. A gas to a liquid is condensation, and usually they occur together. A solid to a gas is sublimation, and a gas to a solid is deposition, and usually they occur together. All right, got your terms. Sublimation and deposition may be the two that you're not quite as familiar with, but make sure you have those in your vocabulary also. Now, some of the processes that we just talked about are endothermic and some aren't. If you take a liquid and you add heat to it, if you take a liquid and you add heat to it, then the change in energy, the change in enthalpy is greater than zero. So that is an endothermic process. Some processes are exothermic. If you take a gas and allow it to condense, it will condense to a, to a liquid and give off heat. And that is an exothermic process. It's giving off heat. So the delta H of the process is less than zero. So it is exothermic. Remember, when delta H is negative, it's exothermic. When it's positive, it's endothermic. OK, just be sure you're making the connection. Now here is a closed system. In this closed system, we have an air space. And I've got a rubber stopper sitting up here on this flask. We have a quantity of liquid down here in the flask. And in this closed system, what happens is the liquid becomes a vapor. But pretty soon, the amount of vapor up here gets to the point that no more vapor molecules can be accommodated up here. At that point, you might want to say evaporation stops. But ladies and gentlemen, it does not. Instead, what happens is some of the vapor then becomes a liquid. And you have this process set up in this closed container such that the liquid is becoming a vapor and the vapor is becoming a liquid in something that is called a dynamic equilibrium. A dynamic equilibrium. We'll talk more about that later. So in a closed system, you're going to reach a certain vapor pressure. And as long as you hold the temperature constant, your vapor pressure will not increase. 
Got that? It will not increase. Now, since the material was a liquid at room conditions, the gas is properly referred to as a vapor. Generally, we don't refer to something as a gas unless it's above its boiling point or at or above its boiling point. So that's where you run into the difference in the terms between vapor and gas. So make sure you have those correct in your vocabulary also. The pressure then that that liquid is exerting to come off as a gas is called the vapor pressure. That is the vapor pressure. And the vapor pressure is dependent on and only on temperature. Well, I can think of a case in which it can be concerned with something other than that, but we'll get there eventually. Now here's a problem. You have a 20 liter closed container at 40 degrees Celsius. A 20 liter closed container at 40 degrees Celsius. And we want to know what is the minimum amount of water needed to produce a vapor pressure of 55.3 torr. It's the minimum needed to produce a vapor pressure of 55.3 torr. How are your gas laws? Whoops, I'm sorry, I hit the wrong button. Let me try this again. How are your gas laws? Do you remember your gas laws? Well, let's look. Let's go back and remember a gas law that's one of your favorites. PV equals NRT. You remember that? Okay. We want to know how much water. I believe that's going to be moles. The vapor pressure is 55.3 torr. So we have 55.3 torr over 760 torr per atmosphere. Got that? What's the volume? The volume is 20 liters. Got that? N, we're going to look for. R is 0 0.0821 liter atmospheres per mole Kelvin. And the temperature has got to be in Kelvins. I'm going to scoot this just a little bit. Hang on here. And it is at 40 degrees Celsius and 40 plus 273 is 313 Kelvins. Got that? All right. Take a second. Punch it into your calculator. See what you get. While I go over here and locate where I have hidden my calculator. I think I left it in my briefcase. Yes, I did. Here it is. So now let's punch it in. We have 55.3 torr, and we divide that by 760, and we multiply that by 20, and we divide that by 0.0831, and we divide that by 313, and I get that what we need is 56 times 10 to the negative 2 moles of water. Well, did you get that? I hope. 5.6 times 10 to the negative 2 moles times 18 grams per mole equals, I get that just over 1 gram of water, maybe about 1.01 grams of water, will be sufficient to produce that kind of vapor pressure. Did you agree with me? PV equals NRT. You can't ever forget anything in this class, folks. It'll come back and bite you. Let's try another problem. Let's look at this one. Oh, look. You put 350 milliliters of alcohol in an evacuated closed container measuring 6 feet by 12 feet by 8.5 feet. The temperature is constantly maintained at 68.4 degrees Celsius. And the question is, will all of the alcohol evaporate? My goodness, and that's the vapor pressure of alcohol at that temperature. And the density of the alcohol is that. Hmm. 
I think what we're going to have to do is make some notes on this thing. You've got it written down in your workbook there. So we need some space. So hang on. I'm going to get us a little bit of space here. And let's see if we can work on this problem together. Well, let's see. We have 350 milliliters of the alcohol. And we have that big container. I believe it's another PV equals NRT kind of problem. I think it's a PV equals NRT kind of problem. And what do we need to know? We need to know how much alcohol is going to evaporate. That's what we need to know. So what we've got to do is find the volume of this container. Find the volume of the container. And we've got the, the vapor pressure. We're in good shape there. We know R and we know the temperature. Yeah. Let's find the volume of this container. Well, that container, I believe, is 6 feet times 12 inches per foot times 2.54 centimeters per inch. Did you get that? Feet cancel and inches cancel. And that's going to be its one of its dimensions. So let's see. 6 multiplied by 12 multiplied by 2.54. And I get that that is 182.88 centimeters on that side. Now our other side is 12 feet. Well, folks, if it's 12 feet and we do this same thing to it, then that's going to come out with twice that much. So that's 365.76 centimeters, right? Why go to all that other trouble? And if we take 8.5 feet times 12 inches per foot times 2.54 centimeters per inch, why, that's going to come out with 8.5, 12 multiplied, 2.54 that we multiply is 259.08 centimeters. So if we find the product of these three, that's going to give us our volume, isn't it? So 365.76, we multiply that, and 182.88, we multiply it by that. I get that the volume of this container is going to be large. The volume is 1.73 times 10 to the 3, 6, 7, times 10 to the 7th cubic centimeter. Oh, but wait, volume needs to be in what? Yeah, volume needs to be in liters. Well, if we know that one cubic centimeter is equal to one milliliter, then we can take our 1.73 times 10 to the seventh cubic centimeters times a liter per 10 to the third cubic centimeters. And that's going to give us 1.73 times 10 to the fourth liters. That's going to be our volume. Oh, very good. Now, our pressure. What is our pressure? Look at your problem that's written there in your book and look for the vapor pressure. The vapor pressure is 63.7 torr. So we have 63.7 torr over 760 torr per atmosphere, right? Times our volume of 1.73 times 10 to the fourth liters. And that is equal to N times R, which is 0 0.0821 liter atmospheres per mole Kelvin. And our temperature, what is our temperature? Oh, it's 68.4 degrees Fahrenheit. What individual ever came up with a problem like this? Let me find you another sheet of paper and plop it over here, and let's convert Fahrenheit over to Celsius. I'm going to block that for a minute. Do you remember the relationship? Degrees Celsius is equal to what? It's 5 ninths F minus 32. 
So that is equal to 5 ninths of, the Fahrenheit temperature is 68.4 minus 32 degrees. So if we take 68.4 and subtract 32 from it and divide it by 9 and multiply it by 5, I get that it is 20.2 degrees Celsius. Do you agree with me? And 20.2 degrees Celsius, and we add 273 to it, is going to give us the Kelvin temperature of 293.2 kelvins. Close enough. All right. Remember that, 293.2 kelvins. Let's put it in here. 293.2 kelvins. Did that barely get on your screen? Oh, hardly. Let's work it out. N equals... 63.7, enter 760, divide 1.73 times 10 to the fourth, multiply 0 0.0821, divide, and 293.2, divide. If I didn't punch something, oops, divide. I get that moles is 60.2 moles of the alcohol. Now, 60.2 moles of the alcohol, all right? 60.2 moles of the alcohol. The alcohol is C2H5OH. We've got 350 milliliters of a density being 0.78 nine three grams per milliliter and that's going to equal point seven eight nine three multiply it's going to be two hundred seventy six point three grams do we have that well i don't know let's see sixty point two oh i tell you what two hundred seventy six point three grams times one mole over. Two carbons is 24, and six hydrogens is six approximately, and an oxygen is 16. This thing weighs about 46 grams per mole, and so that is 276.3. That is six moles. Now, if I don't have a decimal error somewhere, and you have to watch me on that, then I would say that the six moles of alcohol that we have is not quite enough, to, is not going to be, is all going to evaporate. But you've got to go back and make mighty sure that I'm right there. And I will check everything. And if I have a decimal error, I'll report it in your workbook, and you'll be able to find it right there. Those are good problems, folks. Those are very good problems. It's this kind of problem that we've got to be prepared to work that's going to go back and deal with many, many things that we have studied in chemistry. So you need to be ready then to go back and think along all of those topics we have studied before. Well, we have hardly even started. I mean, all we've done under phase changes is address a little bit on vapor pressure. We've got a lot to do with changes of state. But I think that that is going to wait until next time.